Mr. Schmidt, uh, you talk about the the um, opportunities afforded us by technology, but could you talk a bit about what innovations such as Google Glass mean for yes. our privacy and our personal um, boundaries that we'd like to set, which it seems will be violated whether we want them to or not? Yeah. Um, as a bit of background, I think people have read the articles. Google Glass is now in the hands of roughly 2,000 early adopters, primarily programmers. And because this technology is really, really cool and really, really neat, it's also very impactful. So we've decided to be very careful as to how we roll it out. So for example, the developers have to build apps, we have to check the apps and so forth, and we're going to see what the uses are. I think there are some obvious things that one should not be doing uh, with a personal recorder that's attached to your eye. Um, and I think you can imagine what they are. Right so, here so it, it seems reasonably obvious to me that at a minimum, a new social etiquette will emerge as to when wearing Google Glass is correct and when it's not. Um, but I can assure you that Google is incredibly sensitive to this issue for all, all the reasons that are obvious. And, and the other thing I should mention, I, so I have a copy, a, a set of Google Glass, because I'm an executive at Google, and it's... <laughs> <laughs> because you can pull rank and get them, right? You yeah, have it's, it's really extraordinary. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's, well, former developer, I guess. <laughs> and uh, so you sit there with this little glass and you can see it and you talk to it. And the thing that I found most remarkable is the talking to it. You say Google Glass and then you talk to it and give it a question and it gives you an answer inside of an, ear, of an earpiece through a tympanic membrane. Um, and to me, the breakthrough is not just the visual breakthrough, but also the voice control and so forth. And it's the first time I've seen a wearable computer that worked. Wow. We've got another question back over here. Jump in. Hi, um, my name is Maya Prabhu and I'm a psychiatrist and the question I have is about the psychiatric and psychological sequelae of this world that you are building and I can't help but note that all of us who are constructing this world grew up, developed our emotional capacities, our optimal cognitive capacities, our interpersonal skills, our ability to navigate interpersonal dynamics in a non-digital world. In other words, we developed everything who we are based on our dyadic interactions and group interactions with people in real time and made our mistakes. And so I think it's far too early to say what the negative sequelae of psychological development will be growing up in a world like this. But I think some of my older colleagues who've seen changes in generations across time think that we are developing a generation of people who might have faster processing speeds but poor social skills poor ability to read social cues, and that will have consequences. And there's no data on this, and there's no way we can create randomized controlled trials. But my question is, who takes responsibility for those externalities in that kind of world? And if we decide that in 10 years, we're creating a generation of individuals who don't know how to interact with each other in interpersonally effective ways, what do we do? Uh, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, <laughs> first of all, I, I, I love your question, and I hope we, we, we recorded it. And I should say that I appreciate uh, you as well, because I, uh, my father is a psychologist, my grandfather is a psychiatrist, and my aunt and uncle are both psychologists. I mean, this so explains everything. I, I was say, well, you want one more about We now here. understand yeah. everything there is I to know about say, Jared. Growing up, I was always told that the painter's house is never painted, so you can sort of conclude what you want from that. Um, now, what's uh, I'm still you, thinking you about that, Jared. Uh, <laughs> you might have also said that to me. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but but what's interesting about your your, your question is uh, when I hear it, I am immediately think about this next five billion question, right? So I think about the 57% of the world's population that lives under some kind of autocratic regime and an even larger percentage of the world's population that's coming online who only learn through rote memorization. And so it's easy to focus on you know, some of the pitfalls of technology that maybe we won't interact with each other more, et cetera. And I think that's you know, something seriously to talk about among the first two billion. But for the first time, women in Afghanistan will be able to search and we'll be able to communicate with people. For the first time, uh, individuals in some of the world's most repressive environments will be able to fight rote memorization with critical thinking. And I just have to believe that the benefit of that um, you know, far outweighs whatever um, sort of social deficiencies come with it. That being said, I take the prospect of social deficiencies uh, seriously, and I think that smart people like you will uh, study children of today and tell us all the things that are wrong with them as a result of technology. But, but I'm, not, I'm not sure I actually agree with the premise of the question. Um, when, I was a, when I was a young boy that had the same concern about rock and roll, and somehow we all 
ended and up television. And, and ended up in television, and we all ended up sort of growing up, and most of us have short hair and look normal now. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, my answer to that is that a lot of people have raised a lot of concerns about technology and the impact on children, young adults, learning, and so forth. Um, there's certainly a shift in it, but for example, people have studied the impact of video games and the obsessive use of video games by uh, teenage boys. And the conclusion so far is it improves motor skills, obviously, but it also improves math skills. It moves ma improves math skills because it requires great symbolic reasoning in order to navigate through the games. So sometimes these things have, un have surprisingly interesting conclusions upon the, the, the studies. There's evidence that deep reading, which is something I, we all yes. care about, speaking now as authors, especially. Thank and I have you. a book that needs to be deeply read. We have a book read. full of words, no pictures, <laughs> no <buy> diagrams. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, the deep reading has fallen, fallen, in, fallen somewhat away, and I think that's a cost. But people are doing something else with that time. There probably uh, there's a lot of evidence that people are communicating a great deal more. Um, the evidence on uh, teenagers was that they, on average, they were sending 150 texts per day. Um, which is basically causing the SMS bills to go through the roof. So there's a lot of evidence that, that people are communicating differently, not necessarily less well. Interesting. Another question? Looks like Trish. Yes. Hi. So in your guys' book, you talk about how the, uh, China has an increasing sphere of influence around the world, and you lay out several, you know, actual clear paths of what will happen. So if you guys... Um, what would your recommendations be if you were sitting at the table with State Department and you had to give them a set of recommendations for, you know, since China will, you know, at, there's the impending revolution, something's going to happen. So what do we do in the meantime? Because usually with other sectors or a foreign policy, we have, you know, track two diplomacy efforts where there can be some kind of like, well, I have this many ships and you have this many ships. So what do we do when it comes to all the stuff that you guys were talking about, which is like, you know, cyber surveillance and cyber war? What would your recommendations be? Would it be more of what we've been doing with um, Clinton's, you know, uh, internet freedom policy? Or would you guys have a different set of recommendations? Well, I think there, there's no silver bullet answer. Uh, and we certainly don't think you know, technology is a panacea for, for you know, all of the world's problems. That being said, uh, most of the world's technological infrastructure still has not been built. Uh, and the developing world, which is, which is coming online, these states will have two options, one that looks like the Chinese model, one that looks like the, the Western, uh, European, and, and, and American model. And there's a real question about who's going to build this. Uh, one of, the, question, one of the, the things that we speculate about in the book is that in the future, dictators who have minerals and natural wealth will trade it for surveillance technology and the cyber version of the minerals for arms trade. Uh, when you think about foreign assistance, it's not just about protecting our uh, cyber infrastructure at home. There's a whole bunch of allies out there and vulnerable nations out there that you know, providing cyber security assistance should and will eventually be the new form of development and the new form of, of military aid. So, so let me add, I would actually not work through the State Department. I would try to make America stronger. The, the core challenge to China is that Ch China is busy becoming what the US would like to be yes. uh, as a country. Um, in our lifetimes, China will have both a GDP per person greater than the United States as well as aggregate GDP greater. They have more engineers, more investment. Uh, they're busy uh, building more um, aircraft carriers. All the things that we would like to be monopoly of, they're busy trying to do as well. So you can't prevent them from doing that except by becoming stronger ourselves. And uh, spent a lot of time in Washington and so forth. Uh, everybody here, a lot of people here have as well. The core answer to that is to invest in, in, in innovation and education. Uh, America is fundamentally an innovative country. It's sort of our core identity. And if we can invent the future in America, we can also prescribe it, de design it, and make sure it's consistent with our values. To your lip, from your lips to God's <laughs> ears, right? Or to well, unfortunately, our government, <laughs> America's unfortunately, ears, our government's not actually yes. doing this. Yeah, I was going right? to say, it's but, it, but, but I think it's, but I, I'm quite sure this is the right answer. And everybody spends all their time on these sideshows, but the answer is to make America stronger, faster GDP growth, smarter people, keep the smart foreigners that we educate in the country in the country. Yeah. Shocking, yeah. The so that they can found, you know, found country companies that will then hire the rest of us, and on and on and on. Farai, you've got something to say, I'm sure. Yes, thank you. Um, Eric, I'm co-authoring a book with Vivek Wadwa called Innovating Women, about women Excellent. in STEM Excellent. and technology, which Excellent. 
Google entrepreneurs donated money to for a match for scholarships. And Jared, I just came from a talk where uh, Alec uh, was just talking about basically the ways that women can influence both global security and GDP growth in domestically and internationally. So I'm wondering how women fit into the picture of what you're talking about in terms of change and what can be done to foster both enterprise and security using the voices and the forces and the entrepreneurship of women. So it's time to lean in. <laughs> well, the, 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 you know, Eric, I think. You, Absolutely. You, Eric, you, you, you've thought about some of the sort of concrete examples of this, but just one quick response is when we talk about 5 billion new people connecting to the internet, the majority of those are going to be women. Yeah. Right, that, 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 that in some respects is, is the most extraordinary part of this. And Eric, why don't you? Sort well, of I was going to start by saying the internet is, is probably the best women empowerment tool we could imagine today because women in developing countries are subject to terrible situations, uh, the, sort of the terrible situation of men treating women and so forth. And it can now be documented, these things can be policed. Uh, we were, uh, I'll never forget, Jared and I went to this uh, house in Pakistan where women who had been attacked by acid on their faces had gone to be repaired. Uh, it is so horrific, it's hard to describe it without crying, because half of them die, and the other half are blinded, which leaves none. And the faces, of course, are terribly disfigured. And the internet, in that case, can be used, and by the way, the perpetrators are known, right? And they're not, and the police do not act. So if you think about it, the internet can name the perpetrators, get the police to act, get this heinous crime killed, and it also allows these women to have an, an identity digitally a business, meet people, and so forth, which they cannot have in their culture because they can't leave the home because of the shame in their culture. So, so that's a simple answer. Now, if we go back to, to and, and it's a profound answer for billions of people, I think. And it, we forget how, how terrible it is to be a poor person in a developing country with a corrupt police force, right? The reality of lack of trust of institutions and so forth. The internet fixing that is one of the greatest things we can ever do. So having, having said that as, an, as a preamble, and with respect to tech, um, the, it, there's a lot of evidence that the new technologies are being adopted by women very quickly. Uh, there's a new generation of women as leaders, which the tech industry is pioneers of, and I think all of that's very positive. Uh, I, th I think we're showing the way, and if we're not, show us how to get there. Excellent. Yes, hi, Mr. Smith. I'm, I'm concerned about uh, more of the geopolitical aspects of modern day reality. And you mentioned Myanmar, where I spent a lot of time in the past year and a half. And you may have as you and your and Google may have as much influence as the State Department. Kerry going there is can be less of effective as you as you are effective as actually going there. And how do you deal with that? Is there is there a lot of government, private sector cooperation in terms of new economies and developing economies, particularly in Southeast Asia where I have a lot of experience? So that I think that's very important that there is that government private cooperation and that it moves forward in directions that, in, in which are based on private discussions, not in the press. And I think it's very important for the development of the region. I think both of us have the view that more internet connectivity is good, and we should do whatever legal means there are to convince governments to turn on the internet. Um, we went to North Korea to try to convince the government to turn on the internet. They kind of did it for two weeks, and then they turned it off again. <laughs> Um, so, well, we tried, but we did the best we could, and I don't know that they're going to invite us back, but if they do, we'll go back. In, in Myanmar, we had a similar message, but the message to the people who are losing power is quite different to the people who are gaining power. To the losing power people in the Internet, you explain to them that the Internet solves all known business problems. That they need economic growth, that they need to, to basically build a proper banking sector, they need new ideas from the West in order to become stronger, which is code for greater wealth for themselves in their system. To the opposition who are winning, right, you talk about internet freedom, internet empowerment, and so forth. If the internet arrives, the people and the internet will take care of the outcome.